So this week I was visiting with Mark. I came over to pick up something and we were talking in the foyer of the house. And I said to him, I was listening to the book of Revelation. And it was talking about what John saw in the vision. And for some reason, this is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay? There's, there are verses and words you hear a thousand times. Then one time you will listen. And so I'm listening, and just one word stuck out at me. In the vision I saw. And I screamed in my truck as I'm driving down the gravel road. I said, yes, it's a vision. It's a vision. I was so excited. I was just yelling in my truck. I'm telling you, uh, like I said, the Holy Spirit doesn't use our emotions to communicate to us. But when something clicks in your heart and in your, because you would say, did it click in your brain? Yes. But did it click in your heart? Yes. Did it click in your spirit? Yes. All at once. Like it just, this excitement just, and you get excited about one word? Really? One word. And I began meditating on this concept that the whole book of Revelation is a vision. There's nothing in this book that we can convert into physical things. And that'll war against all the teaching out there. Like I'm telling you, if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to decide in your heart that you're going to respect that Jesus Christ is giving this vision to John. And everything he sees is a vision. He's not actually in heaven. He's seeing a vision of heaven. Here's the thing. You have to understand all the other prophets, what they saw. Everything they saw was in the Spirit. And you may say, well, the word vision is only used once in the book of Revelation. Yes, but how many times does the word, I saw... See, you don't get it. He saw in the Spirit. It says right at the beginning of the book, I was in the Spirit. And then he saw all of this. He was in the Spirit. Now, to some of us, because we have not been taught, we've been taught so many flaky things about what it means to be in the Spirit. People assume that it's a flaky experience. No. In the Spirit means you see the Word of God. It happens to me all the time. I'm reading the Bible and words come alive. Now those words are spiritual. I can't take those words and convert them into a physical thing or a physical fulfillment of any kind. So people would argue, yeah, but there's seven churches, and they're real churches in Asia. It's a real church. No, it's a vision of a church called Ephesus. Yes, they're real places. That's like saying, Jeremiah, what do you see at the first part of the book? Jeremiah, what do you see? I see the rod of an almond tree. He's looking in the Spirit the Spirit means he understands the concept of what I see has always meant to watch over. And God says, good. Jeremiah, what do you see? In the Hebrew, it says, I see the rod of an almond tree. God says in the Hebrew, good, I will almond my word to perform it. And you're thinking, almond? That's a Hebrew word. He's using the branch of a plant to put across a spiritual concept. He's not actually looking at a physical branch of a plant. He's not holding the branch of the plant. He's seeing in the spirit 
the branch of that plant, the rod of an almond tree. Each word is rich. So God says, I will almond my word to perform it. Meaning, I will watch over it. I will make sure it happens. I will hasten my word to accomplish everything. Now listen, Jeremiah saw that. Did he go and preach to the people about the almond branch? No. He needed to see what God's desire was. I will watch over my word to perform it. The word wasn't fresh to Jeremiah. The word refers to the words of Moses. I will watch over everything I've said so far. I promised you, if you're faithful to me, this and this will happen. You'll be blessed, you'll be protected. But if you're unfaithful to me, I will also do this. The enemy is going to come against you. Your crops are going to fail. There are so many things written already in covenant form. When God says, I will watch over my word to perform it, it wasn't a brand new word to Jeremiah. So we need to understand what it means to be in the Spirit. In the Spirit isn't an experience. It's when your mind and heart read the Word of God and you see eyes wide open. This is something Christians don't understand. If you exalt Jesus Christ as the truth, then the Spirit of God is automatically in your life. It's not a sensation. There's no buzz. It's not a feeling. He's there to be present. As you read the Word of God, He takes those words and He puts them in your heart. Just like the other day, me driving my truck. I was just listening to the book of Revelation. I'm literally driving my truck, and one word pops out at me, and I just go into preaching mode. I don't know who I was preaching to, but I was preaching to my steering wheel. Oh, vision! It's a vision! I was so excited. The idea of in the Spirit. See, that word to me comes alive, but you see, my mind is like all over the Bible, all of a sudden. I'm thinking, wow, that agrees with Jeremiah, that agrees with Isaiah, that agrees with Ezekiel, that agrees with Daniel. All the things they saw was in a vision in the Spirit. And we have been given that same Spirit. Acts chapter 2 is what it's supposed to be about that we all can see like prophets. Read the Word of God, and it just, oh, it comes alive. Because I read all the accusations that are written against me. I know the book of Revelation is being fulfilled. Why? Because they're angry. This is what God's been desiring for ages that we see spiritually, we get out of the carnal realm, and we read the Word of God, and it comes alive. And you know what? When a word comes alive, there's just something in me. I can't say it softly. It's just bursting. One word, and the rest of the Bible, everything my mind could actually handle within a few seconds, just blows my mind. One word, vision. Then everything I've ever read about the visions of the prophets. Jeremiah, what do you see? Oh, it all comes alive. There's nothing in the book of Revelation that's going to be fulfilled in any physical way. You've been misled by 95% of the teachers when it comes to eschatology. Hal Lindsey was wrong right from the get-go. Did you know the whole premise for his teaching of the book of Revelation is that he believes that Jesus sent John into the 20th century. 
And when I said that the last time, someone wrote me and said, Oh, well, obviously, Jesus didn't send John to the 20th century. I'm thinking, oh, okay. He sent him to the 21st century. Oh, my God. Do you get it? You are so carnal. And then other people would write me when I would say, Listen, the prophets weren't looking at technology in any century. They were looking at the Word of God. They were looking at the glory of God so that they could go and preach and condemn the worship of other gods. They had to see God as He was. But it wasn't a revelation to them like, oh, gee, they're, oh, I didn't know God looked like that, or I didn't know that God had character like that. Oh, yes, they did. The vision confirmed what was already in their hearts. That's what made them prophets. They knew the problem long before they saw the glory of God. Then they went and confronted the false. Why? Because God had refreshed in them what was true. The carnal mind has always been the enemy of God. All You just have to go back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, and you'll figure that out. At the time of the flood, why did God destroy flesh? My spirit will not strive forever with flesh. I repent for making them. I believe there's timing that when we read the book of Revelation, it's not about future. It's not about us figuring about when it's going to happen. We need to read the book of Revelation to know that this has been unfolding. Because you're thinking, okay, where's the judgment of the flesh? Mm -mm, it's been around. The judgment of the flesh has always been present. All we have to do is look around us and see the failures of ministries today. It's happened over and over and over for hundreds of years. Because they won't repent. They won't return to the knowledge of God revealed in Christ. That's why they can't see. The very fruit of the flesh takes them over. And God gives you over to what you desire. How many people follow the concept of how Lindsay and all teachers like him? What made them popular to begin with? The multitudes are more carnal than you care to admit. Like, people write me and say, oh, come on. The church isn't that bad. Oh, yes, it is. It's been that bad for hundreds of years already. Carnality is ruling. So we look at the New Testament, we think, yes, Jesus came and brought the truth. Well, so did the prophets. Hebrews 1.3 says that in the past, he spoke to us by his prophets. Has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. It's the same message as the prophets. Because they could see God as he is. We are not seeing God as he is today in the modern church. Well, we can't see him as he is because we don't understand that the one that revealed him is his son. Yes. Listen, when John the Apostle said in 1 John, Antichrist, he said there would be many. The majority of the church today is anti-Christ because their concepts, they'll argue about God all day long, but they won't reveal God as Jesus revealed God. That's anti-Christ. I'm not anti-Christ because we talk about God. You're missing the mark. The Mark, the bullseye, is Jesus Christ. You're not going to understand the book of Revelation without making sure that Jesus is the truth first. This is Jesus giving all of these visions.
to John. That's what made him a prophet. Everything he saw was in the spirit. None of it is going to come to pass in a physical way. You should see the teachers. They'll read, oh, the stars fall from heaven. They'll say, well, a star, no, not a real star, because the star is bigger than the earth. Well, then it's got to be meteorites. <laughs> You've just stepped out of the Bible again. The Bible actually tells you what the sun, moon, and stars represent in the spirit. They're leaders who rule. Even my thick head, I need revelation once in a while. Because I'm telling you, when I'm reading or listening to the book of Revelation, in the back of my mind, I've got all that teaching long before you guys came along. See, you, you're so lucky. <laughs> You didn't have all that teaching. But my mind, my heart, needs the help of the Holy Spirit. He needs to come along and say, as you're listening to the book of Revelation, Ted, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what vision means. My mind was blown. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. So if you respect Christ as the truth, the Spirit of God will come and help you understand Jesus, the living Word. All of the book of Revelation are the words of Christ, living words, not physical words. None of this is fulfilled physically in any way. In people's minds, I know, they scream because mine has done the same thing for years and years. I'm telling you, the day that I was reading about the, the bride coming from heaven, and then I realized, oh, this city. I thought that that was going to be the city we live in. Oh, it's a vision of the bride. Yeah. See, there was a carnal part of me that was disappointed. <laughs> it's the vision of what God wants the bride to be. It's got 12 foundations of beautiful stones. It's 12,000 furlongs. If you take 12,000 furlongs and convert it into miles, so you get 1,500 miles. See, 1,500 is not a biblical number. But 12 is. That's why the city has 12 foundations. And it's 12,000 furlongs. That's why there's 12,000 from each tribe. 12 tribes. It's the concept of 12. It's a spiritual concept. It's not a physical number. We can't understand the concept of 12. God's using that number on purpose. Jesus is giving that vision to John on purpose. Because we have to be founded on Christ Jesus and the teaching, the 12 foundations of the teachings of the apostles. Then you have a bride that's ready. But we don't have a bride that's ready. Oh, it's full of spot and wrinkle. Its garments are full of garbage. Spots and wrinkles represent false teachers and false teachings. It's absolutely riddled with false teachings. All of the popular ministers that you have today are popular because they're carnal. Because most of the church is carnal. That's why those ministers are making millions of dollars. It's the only reward they're going to get. Temporal. God has given them over. This is what you want? Yeah, I'll give you the quality that comes out your nose. Yeah. yeah. There it is again. You want flesh? I'll give you so much quail, it'll come out your nose. Now you can really understand when he says, when he comes back, will I find faith? Mm-hmm. 
Because faith is faith in the Word of God. Yes. Faith comes by the Word. Yeah. And hearing. But you can't hear if you don't have the Spirit. No. Because the carnal mind can't understand what faith is. I read the book of Revelation, and faith rises up. I used to say, when I'm reading the book of Revelation, I want it to come to pass. But as I read the book of Revelation more and more, I see by faith that this book is actually being fulfilled all around us. God is giving people over to the flesh. We think. We're looking into the future. And we've got all these ships that support the great Hur, the system. That's not in the future. That's right now. Everyone that has a ship in the sea. I'll say it as straight as I can. Every ministry is a ship in the sea. Why? Because they're supported by the multitudes. That's what the sea represents. The support of the multitude holds the ship up. You can't trade in that market unless you have a ship and you're a merchant. Their merchants are selling to you is carnal teachings. That's why they're making money off of you. Is because you're buying up that carnal teaching, hook, line, and sinker. And all the false teachers are making money mm -hmm. off of teachable people. And I'm telling you, it makes me angry, and I know it makes God angry. Because these people are teachable. But you're bilking them with all your carnality. And they're buying it up. You're destroying them. You're destroying these people. Yeah. They had teachable hearts, but their hearts have been destroyed by carnal teachings. See, you have the hard ground because the crowd goes that way and tramples down the soil. You can't plant a seed in that soil yeah. because of the traffic. That's why Jesus said, many will go that way. But for you to squeeze past that crowd to get out of there, it's hard. That's why the gate is, it's this picture. See, it's not a physical gate again. It's a spiritual gate in your heart. You have to fight against all the teachings of men and say, I'm going to go God's way. I'm going to go the way that Jesus showed me. Which means there will be few. It's a struggle to get out of the flow of where most people are going. To go for that narrow gate of trying to understand the word. Not the way the majority understands it, but the way Jesus was saying. All of your knowledge that you gather I'm talking about a lot of knowledge. People that are angry that write me because of my approach to the book of Revelation, they're so carnal. So they'll quote a couple of verses and I will defend those verses and tell them how I see those verses. Now, their premise has been destroyed with biblical thought. The only thing left for them is to attack me, personally. Just like the Pharisees. See, the book of Revelation talks about the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren isn't just the devil. The accuser of the brethren is all the people just like the devil. They're resisting the revelation of Christ. That's why they're called Antichrist in their teachings. Because they resist Jesus, just like the Pharisees resisted Jesus. 
That's why Jesus could turn to them and say, you are of your father, the devil. This book reveals to you that the accuser of the brethren are people. Stubborn, carnal people, absolutely filled with carnal knowledge. And here's the thing. It's all Bible. Just like the Pharisees. Everything they did, they thought it was all Bible. They took the Word of God, mixed it with the seed of men, that's the thoughts of men, and made rules and regulations and oppressed the people of God. The same thing is happening today. There's no liberty in their concept of the Word of God. Oh, not, not at all. Not at all. The Word of God, when it's carnalized, becomes a letter that kills. It's supposed to be the spirit of liberty. Sure, sure. It's supposed to be good news. It's supposed to be good news. But when you see, when the world sees the church the way it is, they go, that's not good news. No, it's not. I want nothing to do with that. I'm reading the book of Revelation and it talks about earthquakes and great shakings. When I looked up that word, you see, because of Hal Lindsey's teachings and 95% of Christian teachers when it comes to eschatology, they look at earthquakes and volcanoes, physical earthquakes, physical volcanoes. The very word earthquake, if you look it up, means a gale of wind that brings a great shaking. How do you convert that to earthquake? It's because you don't bother to even look at the root words. God isn't bringing a great shaking like in the days to come. He's been bringing that great shaking by his word. His word has been present this whole time. God's just been looking for people to declare his word as he meant it. That's why he says he's looking to and fro. God's always been that way. Looking to and fro through the whole earth to find a heart that is committed to him. And he will show himself strong on their behalf. And I'm telling you what, there's been many and I think of all the people down through the ages who never became famous, mm -hmm. but they had a heart after God. See, what I wanted to do today, I wanted to get into the sun, moon, and stars. Because people read that and say, oh, the sun became black. The physical sun? No, again, you're stepping outside of the Bible. The Bible actually explains to you what the sun, moon, and stars represent right from the first page. Genesis chapter 1 tells you the sun, moon, and stars are to rule. Then you see again in the vision that Joseph had, he told all of his brothers and his family, in a vision, God showed me in a vision that the sun, moon, and stars, 11 stars, because he's the 12th, the sun, moon, and stars bowed down to me. They actually knew in the Hebrew language what that meant. And his father said, how in the world am I your father, your mother, and your 11 brothers going to bow down to you. But see, that was the word of God to Joseph. It actually came to pass. But it was spiritually true first. It wasn't physically coming to pass for many years. The sun became black as sackcloth. Why? Because that is a picture of leaders. Joseph's father interpreted it for him. 
I, your father, am not going to bow down to you. The moon was his mother. The eleven stars were his brothers. Now that is the beginning of all the people of God. The sun, moon, and stars speaks of leadership. In that case, it's more the picture of the patriarchs. That out of these sons, out of this family, came all the people of God. Why? Because of the faith of Jacob. The meaning of Jacob is to, to grab hold of. Okay? That's why Bible names are so important. Then later on, his name was changed to Israel, meaning, I will hold on to God and not let go. Israel. Now, that same spirit is found in Joseph. He had that vision. And it carried him through everything he faced. And I see the same thing when I read the book of Revelation. I see the same thing when I read all of these verses in the book of Revelation. I see what God's plan is, and I have faith that it actually is happening, and it's been happening, because it. see, the Word of God is yesterday, today, and forever. The truth of God is yesterday, today, and forever. That's why when I'm reading, I have faith that this is not future. It's actually now as well as it was yesterday. And as it will be tomorrow. Yep. It will continue. Yeah. Joseph had that kind of faith. So that vision, sun, moon, and stars that bow down to him helps you unfold the meaning of sun, moon, and stars. And that theme carries all the way through Scripture. The sun, moon, and stars represent people that are supposed to be leaders. They're supposed to be sources of light. But by the time you get to the book of Revelation, it says the sun became as black as sackcloth. Why? Because out of leadership is no light whatsoever. The moon became blood. Why? Because blood is the life of the flesh. You're not even reflecting light anymore. You're just a bunch of flesh-speaking carnal concepts. It's nothing but blood. And the same thing is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 because they're quoting Joel chapter 2. Yeah. The sun, moon, and stars are mentioned in Acts chapter 2 as well. Why? Because now the believers are filled with the Spirit of God, prophesying the Word of God, revealing Christ. That's the Spirit of Christ. That's the Spirit of prophecy. And the stars falling from heaven? That's easy to see once you understand. Sun, moon, and stars are leadership. Are we watching leadership falling all around us today? What I said, they can't just go on forever teaching people carnal concepts. Someone has to expose them. So as we expose their false teaching, I believe God takes those words and say, good, good, we finally have a voice on the earth saying the same thing I've been saying all along. Yeah. Doesn't he talk about the, the shaking and the figs falling up? Right here. Revelation 6. So the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs. Actually, that's not a very good word, late. It's untimely figs because this ties to what Jesus did in the New Testament. Okay, Untimely figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. What kind of shaking? It's not an earthquake. It's a mighty wind shaking. Now, that mighty wind is Jesus because it's the force of the Spirit of God, the wind of God. That's what Jesus was trying to teach. 
when he said to Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it wants to. Yeah. That's the Spirit of God. That same Spirit was upon Christ. He walked up to a fig tree. It wasn't the time of fruit. See it saying? It drops its untimely figs. Jesus went over to the fig tree and cursed it. Why? Because this fig tree, once again, is a picture of God's people. What they had become. Fruitless. Yeah. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. That's why he cursed the fig tree. It wasn't a miracle on the side. Oh, by the way, I'll just curse this fig tree while we're walking past it. Yeah, because he had nothing better to do. Like he didn't have any purpose. John MacArthur would probably say, well, he did that to show off his deity. Oh, for Pete's sakes, John, repent. Yeah. Jesus had a purpose in everything he did. He is fulfilling the word of God. And by the way, when I say the Word of God, it also means the life that we get from the Word, but also the judgment against the flesh. Jesus manifests that by cursing the fig tree. No fruit, you're not going to continue. Yeah, it's useless. It's done. See, the temple system had become so carnal... Jesus put an end to it. When he died on the cross, that was the end of that system. And then you have teachers like John MacArthur saying, well, the temple's going to be restored. John, you're just full of flesh. Yeah. That is not the message of the Spirit of God. Jesus established his temple on the third day. Yeah, yeah. His temple is here. We're the third temple. You don't need another physical temple. Jesus put an end to that physical system. I believe what that concept really struck me when I was listening to the book of Revelation and that word, vision, just came alive. I can't describe it to you, but it's like hundreds of scriptures all coming alive at once. Prophetic vision, seeing the word of God coming to pass. All of a sudden, my mind went to every prophet. Jesus is giving a vision to the prophet John. It's a living word, and it's alive today. We have to change the way we approach this book or we will not understand it. Therefore, if you want to understand it, if you truly want to understand the book of Revelation, then dismiss everything you've ever been taught from Hal Lindsey and 95% of the eschatology teachers out there. Dismiss it all and start knowing that Jesus Christ is speaking the same way he spoke when he taught parables, because all of this is spiritual, parabolic language. There is no physical fulfillment of this. No. No. We've been so guilty of taking bits and pieces of Scripture and saying, this part is spiritual and this part is carnal, mm -hmm. or physical. Or we'll take a scripture and we'll say, well, the part of this verse is spiritual or parabolic. Yeah. And the other part is literal yeah. or carnal. Yeah. No, the whole word of God is spirit. This book is a vision all the way through. There's nothing physical in here. We've had hundreds and hundreds of years of these carnal teachers leading us astray. I believe the time has come to an end. We need to start over. I think I'll end it there.